Okay, but I'm going to give a formal introduction to Dr. Purich. Uh, he, he's familiar with it because he wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> so I will primarily just read it, even though I could give it without reading it uh, for the most part. Uh, Dr. Purich actually grew up in Western Pennsylvania. He sort of took a leaf out of Sarah Palin's book, but in his case, when he came out on his front porch, rather than seeing Russia, he could see Ohio uh, from his Pennsylvania residence. Uh, anyway, that didn't hold him back too far, and he, he wound up going to graduate school at Iowa State University, where he received uh, his PhD. Uh, and uh, I think it was in 1973. I uh, worked with a fellow named Herb Fromm there uh, on a particular enzyme. Um, and he was supposed to go directly, he was unusual, and nowadays it takes a long time for anybody to get a faculty position, but Dan actually was supposed to go directly to a faculty position at the University of California at Santa Barbara, uh, but he got a special fellowship uh, and it enabled him to go to the NIH uh, to work, I guess it was just for one year. Is that right, Dan? That's uh, 10 months, one year, yeah. Uh, with her with her very famous biochemist there named Earl Statman, where, uh, where he continued his work uh, on glutamine synthetase. Uh, from there, he went to the University of California in, in Santa Barbara in... Uh, which has a nice setting when the fog isn't there. And uh, he was in the Department of Chemistry and he uh, progressed starting in 73 from assistant professor. Uh, and uh, by the time he departed in 1982, he was a full professor of chemistry. Uh, what's, what's of interest to us today is that while he was there, uh, he received the Harold Plows campus-wide teaching award, which I think is pertinent probably to his talk today, and, he, and also a research career development award from the NIH. So in 1984, I came here to the University of Florida as the chairman of the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, and he served as the chair until 1996 when he uh, stepped down and became a, uh, a full-time uh, faculty member. Um, in 2007, uh, he was given the College of Medicine's uh, a very prestigious basic science teaching award. So that's two teaching awards at different institutions. Uh, and he served on a variety of editorial boards from, various biochemical journals and reviews, study sections at the, uh, at the NIH. And he has edited or written several, I can only describe as tomes <laughs> of research uh, uh, reviews and, and, uh, and um, I don't want to say text, but handbooks is what I really want to say. Anyway, he's a very accomplished biochemist and he's agreed to help us this year it, or it, in this particular course. Uh, he's going to talk about the Nobel Prize from 2019 uh, in uh, chemistry, which was awarded to three people for the development of the lithium ion battery. We all use lithium ion batteries if you have a telephone or anything else. And so this is, this is a very pertinent lecture, which we all should be able to relate to. So Dan, it's all yours. Well, thank you very much, Ken. It's my pleasure to be here. Uh, I must say that, uh, uh, as I said to someone earlier, that this reminds me that of my halcyon days at UC Santa Barbara, when as a chemistry professor, uh, you must learn to uh, discuss all things chemical. Um, chemistry professors don't like biochemists only to teach biochemistry. So during my time there, 
I was forced to teach general chemistry, organic chemistry, physical chemistry. And then when a colleague got uh, multiple myeloma, I ended up teaching quantum chemistry, staying three pages ahead of the graduate students in the course. And uh, when you're teaching with only three pages ahead of the students, it's a nerve wracking semester. But, uh, but I enjoy chemistry so much. And I think uh, that as a biochemist, uh, it's a wonderful thing to be able to join the principles of chemistry to biology. Today, I'm going to tell you about uh, lithium ion cell, but I wanted to say that all of these cells are what we call voltaic cells. And we'll see that this comes from the name Volta. Uh, Alessandro uh, Volta was the discoverer or inventor of, um, of the battery, or, or so he's credited. And, oh, and let me see, what am I doing here? And the, um, the battery is pretty significant in our world. Um, as Ken said, we use them for everything. Um, and in fact, the global market's about $108 billion in 2019. It's rising very sharply at about 14% annually. And it's because um, of uh, the Tesla automobile, the Volt that uh, Ed Wilkinson has and other people. And so uh, it's common now uh, for us all to rely on batteries uh, tremendously much. And it turns out that it's going to even go further than that because with, with these new wind turbines and and uh, solar energy sources, we need storage. We don't want to just have uh, the, the energy uh, assets available. And now with these new windmills that, are, uh, that have uh, veins on them the length of football fields, they're very high power devices. Uh, and, and if you can store that energy, it can be very helpful. So it's thought that by in the, in the next 10 to 12 years, uh, the global battery market will be at at least a half a trillion dollars a year. And this 108 billion is an interesting number because 80% of that is really money coming from the lithium ion battery and from the, the discoveries that were credited in the 2019 Nobel. So uh, here uh, I, I just start with, with my presentation. Um, um, everyone would love to get one of those gold medals in the upper right. And um, I'll tell you about the three guys that, that succeeded. On the lower part of this slide, I call your attention to these lithium ion batteries that Tesla cells that you can put in your house. If you have three of them, you can run your air conditioner, um, run all the appliances in your house, uh, and, you, and you can get the energy for that from, from say, the uh, photo cells on your roof uh, if you're in a bright enough place. So this lower panel, I show you uh, just that, that way of storing energy. On the right, I show you the chassis of the uh, Tesla automobile and that frame at the bottom that's in grayish white is the battery. And uh, the battery is there it's able uh, with, the, with the Tesla, I think you can go 300 uh, miles on a Tesla and you can do it at pretty good speed. Speed is an important thing because um, when we learn physics, we learn that um, energy uh, is equal to, kinetic energy is equal to uh, mv squared uh, or one half mv squared. And the v means that if you increase the velocity by a factor of two, you have to increase the amount of energy by a factor of four to push things forward at that speed. And that's because of friction. And so it's a big difference between using a battery to drive your golf cart at a couple miles an hour versus that big frame Tesla at uh, 90 or 100 miles an hour. And so batteries had to get lighter. They had to get more energy dense and uh, uh, that's what we're going to see. Then lower right, you see um, the three Nobelists. They are uh, shown here 
um, ready to receive their Nobel Prizes. They've already been to Dahlqvist uh, Taylor in Stockholm and they've gotten these nice uniforms for the day. And the citation reads that, they, that the award for 2019 rewards the development of the rechargeable lithium ion battery. And I don't have to say much more. I've said that they're lightweight, that they're used in many different um, uh, forms and that they store significant amounts of energy. Uh, by the way, the 2000 uh, or the December 10th date is important because that's Nobel's birthday and that's the required time when the, when the prize is given. And they're sitting all, I had a movie, but I couldn't upload it so easily, but they're sitting in the city hall, the Alemania of, um, uh, uh, for Stockholm. And this is the annual place where, where people gather. The three Nobelists are shown here, John Goodenough, uh, Stanley Whittingham, and Akira Yoshina. Uh, and I show you a little biographical information on them here. You see that Goodenough was born in Jena, uh, Germany, but he uh, was schooled at the University of Chicago and uh, has done all of his research in the United States. Whittingham was born in the UK, trained at Oxford, but did the main body of his work in the United States. And then Yoshino trained, uh, trained at Osaka University in Japan, and he uh, worked um, at uh, Meijo uh, University in Nagoya uh, for, for his career. Now I show on this next slide their ages. And I do so because John Goodenough is the oldest person ever to get a Nobel Prize. He received the prize at age 97 which uh, is very unusual. In fact, when, when Ken and I were first learning about Nobel Prizes back in the early 50s, when we only knew them by name, um, people rarely got the Nobel Prize when they were over 50 or 55, especially in physics, uh, the, the ages were younger. But now the ages have, uh, have gotten up pretty high because there were so many discoveries made that were Nobel worthy that people had their awards delayed. And this is unusual because in the Nobel will where the monies are provided for the award, it stipulates that the award is really given to encourage further research at the level that, that the investigator had already done. It's unlikely that Goodenough is going to do much research at age 97. Uh, so things changed a bit. Um, uh, to give you an example, my um, academic grandfather, Paul Boyer, got his Nobel Prize for discovering how ATP is made at the age of 80. But my other academic grandfather on the other side of the, on my uh, uh, postdoctoral side uh, was, um, Fritz uh, Lippmann, and he got the prize at 48. So in the 1950s, it was more common to get the prizes early. The guy who's credited with inventing the battery is um, Alessandro uh, Volta. I put quotes in my, uh, in, uh, uh, around the word inventor because I'm gonna come back and talk about what invention really means. But you can see on the right, uh, the battery that he made. He made these by stacking up copper and zinc plates separated by a, um, a piece of uh, leather that was soaked in a, in a particular acid and brine solution. And he could stack these up and the more that he had, the greater the, the voltage and we'll talk about that. And he did this in um, around uh, 1800. Uh, when he did this, uh, it created quite a stir. In fact, uh, Napoleon uh, paid his way to come to France so that Napoleon could see what, what had been achieved. And within a couple years, these batteries were used quite a bit. In fact, I, I know many of you travel and some of you may have been uh, to the very famous Galleria um, Doria Pamphili 
which is just off the Piazza Venezia in Rome. And there um, I saw about 25 years ago, the lights on the wall, sconces on the wall that were almost 200 years old. They were, they were electric light bulbs from the early 1800s. And no sooner did Volta invent this battery, people were taking advantage of it. And I know that we credit Edison with the light bulb, but these light bulbs uh, in this rich family's um, uh, palace or palazzo, uh, they were able to work because they used platinum filaments. And platinum is not um, oxidized so easily and so they could do this. So people were already trying to do things. In fact, um, uh, Sir Humphrey Davy stacked up a thousand of these and created the first uh, kilovolt uh, source of electricity in the world. And that was done only a couple years after Volta. So uh, there's very interesting history around the battery. Now, the principles of the battery that, that Volta discovered uh, he, he actually worked with a brine solution, but others around him found quickly that you could use lemons to do this. And you see on the right um, in gray, those are zinc electrodes or plates that are, that are pushed into a, a lemon. And on the left are copper plates. And they're all lined up in series. So if you actually tra traced all the, the wires, uh, the wire um, closest to the top here is going to the light emitting diode, and then the one um, um, over here on the lower right is, is going over to the diode. So they're all in, in series with each other. That allows their voltages to add, and it, it gives enough of an electromotive force to turn on that, that um, little light emitting diode. Now, the principles of this, this illustrates the arrangement of these three voltaic cells to form a battery. And the idea of a battery, by the way, didn't come with Volta. It was uh, Benjamin Franklin who was first using capacitors, uh, Leiden jars, that he could store up electricity. And then he put them in series. And because he took a number of them in a row, just like a number of cannon in a row, he coined the word battery. And that's the word we use today. So that was really our friend, Ben Franklin, uh, who, who did that. Oops, let me see if I can go back, or I can just read it here. So electricity, as we're gonna see in these batteries, is gener generated chemically by two kinds of reactions, one called an oxidation reaction, and then the opposite of that is called a reduction reaction. And so we're going to see that the zinc and copper electrodes have some interesting properties. One electrode is going to always lose electrons and the other electrode is always going to gain electrons. And the acidic juice that's inside of a lemon is important because it's going to, the acid is going to play a, a key role in the process. Now, you could take a galvanized nail and you could take a penny and you can put them into a lemon and I say here that Kate Wilkinson can try this out in her otherwise idle kitchen. Uh, I say that because I'm sure she's eating well at Oak Hammock and Neat and Cook. Um, but, uh, but the trick is put them close enough together, Kate, if you try this. The galvanized nail has zinc on the outer surface. And of course the penny, if you get an old one, uh, is truly made of copper. And, and if you put them together, close enough, you can stick your tongue across it and you can feel the electricity going through your tongue. Uh, I did that at about seven or eight years old and I still remember the little zing that I got. Now, because we're putting the batteries in series, we can add up their voltages and the voltmeter then shows us the reading that you can get a fair amount of, of voltage out of just a lemon. If you want this to really work well, you take the lemon, as I used to tell my students at the University of California when we would do this in the, in the lecture hall, uh, the best way to do this is take the lemon and, and bounce it off the floor a few times so that you break up 
all of the, uh, and get all the juice within it connected up so it makes a really good electrolyte solution. And when we link these all together, as they say in the lower right, that's what, where we get this word battery. So I said that the chemistry that's involved is one of oxidation and reduction. So what is oxidation? It's the loss of electrons. So on the left here, I show you a, a neutral atom. An atom is always has, when it's in its neutral form, always has the same number of protons and electrons. And then certain atoms will lose an electron. And when they do, the atom will take on a positive charge if they lose one electron, and we call that a cation. On the right, you see that lithium is neutral. That's what the zero means. That's the elemental form. And it can lose an electron to form a lithium ion. Reduction is just the opposite. It's the gain of electrons. And so if we have an ion and it picks up an electron, then we form the neutral form X uh, superscript zero, which means that's the element. So an example of that is that a proton happily will pick up an electron. And when it does, it'll form a hydrogen atom, H zero. And two of those hydrogen atoms immediately react because these are called uh, free radicals. They have unpaired electrons, they immediately react and they form H2 hydrogen gas. And we'll talk more about hydrogen gas in just a little bit. So you might ask, why do sub substances undergo reduction more readily than others? That is to say, why are some reduced and why are some oxidized? And this really relates to something called electron affinity. So substances with the greatest electron affinity always will have the greatest uh, ability to gain electrons. They have this high affinity, they pull the electrons toward them. And we're going to uh, see that that, um, uh, that can help us to understand how battery works. So now I'd like to go back to, Bolt, uh, to Volta's battery and sort of go step by step uh, to explain how battery works. I do this not because um, uh, some of you need to know, Ken, Ken certainly knows and and I see Bill Kem there, he certainly knows how battery works. But this lecture should be clear enough so that poets uh, can understand. And so I'll speak to the poets here um, uh, or, to, uh, or to the literature majors like Kate uh, so that they can understand how battery works. So here we see the zinc uh, anode um, and then we see on the left the other electrode, the, the, the copper one. And uh, you see them immersed in a solution. That solution is sulfuric acid. We call that the electrolyte solution. And because sulfuric acid is a strong acid, it mostly ionizes to form hydrogen ions or protons. Those are H plus and sulfate anions. And so that's the blue solution at the bottom. And what you see is there's a wire uh, going between the, uh, the two electrodes. There's this electric wire and it's going to the light bulb. Technically, I should have drawn it so that this wire goes to, to this surface and the other wire comes down to the tip where the connection is made to complete the circuit. But I'm not a very good artist and I drew these late at night. And so um, uh, I tried to do the best I can. Now, if Ken is still awake, uh, sometimes he nods off. Um, I will ask uh, Dr. Burns, so, uh, so why the smiles on the faces of these two uh, electrodes? Ken, do you have an answer for that? All right, Ken is not going to answer. So let me say, they form a redox couple. And with Ken and, and Laura being a happy couple, I thought that I would make these electrodes so they would sort of have happy faces. And you, you see the two there. The zinc one is going to lose the electrons and the copper um, uh, electrode is going to pick up the electrons. So the electrons are going to pass through that light bulb, uh, through, the, uh, through the outer part of the light bulb. They're going to raise the temperature of the filament because this, this filament is actually a resistor and it wants to, to resist the motion of those electrons 
And once the, the temperature of that filament gets to about 3000 degrees centigrade, believe it or not, then we have an incandescent light. That's why incandescent lights uh, require so much energy is that you have to put a lot of electrons to heat up the filament. Now, what I'd like to do is just sort of take you through step by step how, how this works. And so here we have a light bulb, it's off. We have these two electrodes sitting, sitting in a solution of sulfuric acid and the zinc um, plate, the zinc has a low affinity for electrons. So the electrons come off and for each electron that is generated, we form one of those gray circles shown in the solution, that's the zinc ion. And, and what happens is as we accumulate those ions, then the electrons start to enter the bulb and I've, I've sort of highlighted the bulb a little bit to make it look like it's, uh, it's starting to light up weakly. And then in these next three slides, which I will click through quickly, you'll see the flow of electrons. Okay, and why did the electrons flow that way? Well, it's the case that, that copper is such a very good conductor of electrons as, that as the electrons come from, from the light bulb, through the light bulb, oops, let's go back up there. As they come through here, uh, they come down and the electrons, as I show at the bottom, they combine with a proton to form a neutral um, hydrogen. Um, and that two of those hydrogen zeros combine, those free radicals combine to form hydrogen gas. So anytime you have a voltaic cell, you're producing hydrogen gas. And uh, so here I show a fresh battery and I show uh, the principles that I've showed you before. Here we see their happy faces, but now I show you that they're frowning, which I'm showing you a discharge battery. They're frowning because if you look at the lower part of, of the zinc electrode, it's already disappearing. So the battery will only work as long as the, as the zinc can sacrifice uh, some of the zinc metal becoming zinc ions that will be in the solution. But once we run out of those, those um, zinc um, of the metal, we're in trouble. And so Volta's battery is not rechargeable. So all of the uh, primary batteries, we call primary batteries, batteries that we don't recharge, they all have this problem that they undergo the chemical reactions irreversibly, when they're, when they're done, we find a little plastic bag, we, we put them all in the plastic bag, take it to the recycle center and say goodbye. In the 1850s, a guy, um, a French physicist figured out how to make a rechargeable battery. And he did it using a lead acid battery, uh, using sulfuric acid and lead. And, and he was able to make a, a very powerful battery. It's the same battery today that we use in automobiles. And sh so I show you a diehard battery on the left. I show you uh, a blow up uh, diagram of it um, to show you that the battery is a little more complicated inside than the way that, um, that Volta had it. Oh, by the way, I should tell you, Volta, when he discovered the battery, he didn't know what was happening. I didn't say that. It's important to, to know what was happening. He didn't know what the chemistry was. He saw that the electrodes, uh, that the zinc was getting, um, uh, was uh, corroding, but he didn't know why. And it was Michael Faraday, the very famous scientist in the 1830s, who figured it all out. And all the electrochemistry of batteries um, is really credited to to Faraday, who's really the father of electrochemistry. I, I made a mistake by not telling that earlier. But in a modern battery, like the diehard battery, to improve the performance when you're going to be recharging the battery, you have to have a little porous film between the, the anode and the cathode. And the reason for that is as you recharge and you re 
uh, reattach metal ions back to where they had come off, um, they don't go on evenly and they may actually have little burrs in places. And if you go over a bump in your automobile, one of those could drop off. And if it touches the oppositely charged electrode, you will foul that cell and you'll lose the uh, electromotive force of your battery and you'll be going back to the dealership to get a new battery. So instead, we put these um, uh, porous um, uh, spacers between or films between that uh, and those septa actually keep um, things working a lot better. So they keep the positively charged part of the battery from touching the negatively charged part. Now, lead batteries are, are pretty good. Uh, they have this high surge current, which means they can start a gas engine or a diesel engine. They can be designed a little bit differently so that you can use them, say, to, to power a, um, a golf cart or a, a small trolling motor on, um, um, that someone like Joe Shands must have used, or Ed Wilkinson when they go fishing. But the lead battery has some big limitations. It's um, got a low energy to weight ratio, and that means you need to have a very heavy battery to get much energy out of it. And it has a low energy to volume ratio, which means the battery has to be pretty big. And so both of those things are a real limitation. If we had to carry lead batteries around uh, these days to power our hearing aids and other devices, um, uh, we, we wouldn't like it at all. So the lithium battery became one that was very interesting. Lithium, of course, I show you here on the upper left, lithium is the third element in the periodic chart sitting right below hydrogen. And, and it has a atomic mass that's, that's 30 times lighter than the atomic mass or atomic weight of lead. That means that you can get a lot more charge per, per weight out of a lithium battery. The chemistry is the same, shown at the bottom. The lithium um, loses, uh, the lithium element on the left, Li0, loses an electron and becomes the cation. So lithium batteries were very popular and in the, uh, in the 1970s and uh, 60s and 70s, the lithium batteries were already being used, but they weren't so good for, uh, as a rechargeable battery. And in fact, even today, there, there are batteries that use metallic lithium, metallic lithium, a big piece of metal, um, as, the, um, uh, as one of the electrodes. And the problem with that is that metallic lithium has a tendency to explode. And I show you a, a phone that sort of had a bad day. And, um, and that phone caught fire because the lithium battery can explode. So why does it explode? Well, I, <clears throat> I said to you earlier that anytime you're recharging, as you recharge the surface and put the ions back, they don't get back always uniformly. In fact, if a little bit sticks out, there's more surface area and those areas will tend to grow. And they're sort of like stalactites in a, uh, in a cavern. Uh, so if you've uh, been to any um, of the famous caves, you've seen stalactites. And these long whisker-like structures can keep building, they're very rigid, and they can actually penetrate the septum that's between the two electrodes. They can move all the way over to there, they can short it. And meanwhile, there's a lot of hydrogen gas around. And the hydrogen gas causes the thing to pop and you're in real trouble. And in fact, the Samsung, a couple of years back, decided to use a metallic lithium battery not the newest generation batteries, because they were trying to make the phone cheaper and they paid a big price for it because eventually they had so many problems with it, as you know, that you couldn't take them on airplanes with you. Uh, they, they would specifically quiz you whether you had a Galaxy 7 uh, in your purse or in your pocket. So 
This Nobel Prize in chemistry has to do with making a lithium battery that has a lot of power, but also is much safer to use. And this interest in doing this started in the early 1970s when, um, when OPEC decided to raise the cost of, um, of a barrel of oil from 425 to about $15 overnight. And people started thinking more about windmills and solar power, but if they were going to use those, how would they ever store the energy? And so people started thinking, maybe we have to come out with new forms of uh, batteries. And this is when Whittingham comes into the story. And what he was interested in was developing new methods that could store large amounts of energy so that we could move away from fossil fuels. He wrote an essay about this in the um, early 1970s. And he, he had been working on superconductors. He was thinking originally that if you could make all the wires in the country have superconductors that worked at room temperature, then you would be able to uh, cut down the amount of heat that was used for the conductance of elect uh, electrons, and that would save so much electricity that that would lead to a greener world. But room temperature superconductors were not available at that time, didn't come on until I think the earlier part of, um, uh, the la last part of uh, the 1990s and earlier part of, of the 2000s. But he switched over and started working on, on electrodes. And he developed a very creative way, an innovative way to make a, an electrode. And, it, and incorporate it into a lithium battery. And the idea that he had was he was going to take titanium sulfide, which has a tendency to form plate-like structures, and he could stack these plates up in the right way and, and do this on a microscopic scale so that the, the lithium ions would stay in between these plates. We call this process intercalation. It's the same word that Ken uses when, uh, when he's thinking about how certain organic molecules slip into structures, uh, regions of DNA. This word intercalate means that, that the molecule can slip in between other molecules and can, um, and as he was doing that, what he was keeping in mind was what the advantage would be, that he could increase the amount of, of lithium but also that he could keep the lithium ions and elemental lithium all locally within this uh, layered structure. By doing that, he wouldn't have to rely on the inefficiency of diffusion for the ions that have been released into the solution to come back to the electrode. So he, he did a lot of forward thinking in it. And he came up with what was called the Whittingham um, battery. And you see on the right this titanium sulfide uh, cathode, and you see that I've drawn it so it has these layered structures. And the, and the blow up shows the position of different ions. Meanwhile, notice on the left that we still have that dangerous uh, lithium anode that we have to deal with. And he could make this battery and he can get enough of the lithium ions in the right places that not only could he get a good voltage, a couple volts out of it, but what he could do, this is just one cell, so we can add many more to get more voltage, but it had good storage, meaning he could get um, a lot of energy stored up in that battery. Then Goodenough came along, and uh, Goodenough looked at, at this work, and he liked the idea of using a metal sulfide but metal sulfides have certain electrochemical properties and disadvantages compared to metal oxides. So he proposed that he would make a battery using a metal oxide, and he did this using cobalt oxide. Again, with the idea of forming plate-like structures that could trap lithium ions. And by doing this, he could trap so many ions that he could raise the voltage of the battery and this was a major breakthrough because instead of a two volt battery, he could create a four volt cell. And that was a, a very big advantage. And so here is the good enough 
battery. And you see now it, it has those four volts. I'm showing you the voltmeter. It was fun drawing all these things. Um, so you see the voltmeter there. And you see that there's this layered cobalt oxide shown on the lower right. But we still have a metallic lithium anode and we still have the chance for those stalactite structures, those whiskers to break through the, the barrier and to short out the system. So this is where Akira Yoshino comes into the story. He started thinking about how he could take advantage of Goodenough's electrode, but build a better battery out of it. And so instead of using um, metallic lithium for the anode, he used the substance called petroleum coke. And this is a, a substance that allowed him to uh, intercalate lithium ions. So let's say a little bit about, about pet coke. You know, if, you, if you've ever read about how coal is used in the production of steel, that coal is not very useful for reducing uh, iron ore to steel. Instead, we use something called coke. And coke is made by taking coal and heating it. In the absence of oxygen, it rearranges and it forms this substance coke. We get rid of all the sulfur and everything. And then that's a very good reducing agent to convert iron ions into metallic iron. What Yoshina knew was that you could take heavy crude oil or purified oil and do this uh, in the absence of oxygen, heat it up real high. And when you do this, you form a substance called graphene. I show it in blue in this little square. And if you look closely right above the word graphene, it says Nobel Prize 2010. And that's because another group had discovered graphene and it has such spectacularly interesting properties that they got the Nobel Prize for it. Graphene is shown on the lower part of this slide, little islands of graphene. Oops, and, and the graphene is able to, because the, the structures are enough far away from each other, the lithium ions can get in that. Moreover, because the graphene is real small little islands of graphene, it means the ions can come in and out of these structures very easily. And so the kinetics, the rate at which these chemical reactions can occur are much faster than if you were to try to do this with graphite or with any other um, carbon-based compound. So what he did was he he took Goodenough's battery, he used this uh, pet coke, and he created a battery that was lightweight, hard wearing. What does it mean hard wearing? It means you can bang it around a lot, but also that you can recharge it hundreds of times. So here's his battery. Now he has Goodenough's uh, cathode, which gives the four volts, but on the left, instead of having metallic lithium, He's intercalated the lithium in that pet coke, a petroleum coke, and that is the whole structure over on the left. That battery changed the world because now you have a very good voltage. You have all the advantages of lithium in terms of its weight, and you have stability because this pet coke holds on to the lithium ions. They don't travel into the electrolyte solution. They don't form stalactites. They don't damage the, the neighboring electrode. And so all's well with the world. And so I show this one diagram here. I, uh, actually now that's being built out. This is a four or five acre site in California at Moss Landing. Those of you who've traveled on Highway 1 in California, you'll remember Moss Landing is a little bit north of Monterey. And there's a power plant not far away. And, and people are using batteries of this sort. In fact, this is a Tesla initiative. And um, a 300 megawatt hour battery is being put into Moss Landing. 
and it's enough to power all of San Francisco for six hours. So batteries can store a hell of a lot of energy. And so this is where green energy is going. And at the top of the slide, I say that people have now found that you can even improve things further by using lithium iron phosphate. And this has now become the, the leading candidate for large scale production of these lithium ion batteries. Because iron can undergo oxidation reactions as well. And when assisted by lithium, it has even better electric properties. And I mentioned a battery that Sony Corporation is making. The battery shows relatively little wear. After 8,000 recharge cycles, it's only dropped by about 20% from its original recharge efficiency. And 8,000 recharges means if there are 400 days in a year, there aren't, there are less, then that means you have 20 to 25 years of service out of those batteries before you have to replace them by charging them up each day to serve as major energy sources. So now I want to say, and we've talked about 2019 Nobel Prize, where do I think the Nobel Prize will be given in year 2000 XX? I say XX because I'm not sure of the year, but I'm sure of the outcome. There will be another Nobel Prize in chemistry, probably given to another Japanese scientist. And I'll tell you why. Our current model <clears throat> for having green power is shown on this slide. We have solar up on our roof. We feed the charging of batteries with DC current. The solar and the battery are all DC. So we have to use an inverter to convert the DC current into an alternating current. That's the current we need in our house. We use volts AC, not volts DC. And if we want to return excess power to the power grid, we have to return it as alternating current. So everything we get from solar and from the battery has to go through an inverter. And an inverter that I show here, you see the circuit on the, on the bottom there. And there's a lot of circuitry involved. And converting DC to AC current costs you around 20% loss in power. Part of this is the laws of physics and thermodynamics, but part of it is the practical circuitry of the system. And so converting DC to AC all the time, you're paying a penalty and you have, you're collecting all this energy off your roof and solar, you're storing it in a battery, but you're losing 20% of it. So, about three nights ago, I said to myself, well, why doesn't someone make an AC battery? I thought, gee, this is a great idea. And so I went looking to see if there was any literature on AC batteries. <clears throat> and the Japanese have created an AC battery last year. And they use something called a biode. It's an oscillating electrode. It's neither a cathode or an anode. <clears throat> for one instant, it's one, and then for the next instant, it's another. With a alternating current battery, you can have very low power loss, and therefore you can use, uh, you can harness more of the energy of the battery. So that's where I think uh, the Nobel Prize will be if, um, I, if we wait long enough, if we're around long enough, we'll see whether I'm right. <clears throat> so I come back to Alessandro uh, Volta, and I have highlighted in red this word inventor. And the word invent or means to produce a useful a device or process for the first time. And the question was, did Volta do that? And the answer I would say is no. Why? Because nature invented the battery nearly 2 billion years ago. Nature figured out a way to take CO2 and water through the process of photosynthesis and 
through the use of chlorophyll. And it was able to do this in chloroplasts. You see the membrane structure, which is highly uh, laminar, later, layer after layer, so they can concentrate the amount of, of photoreceptors and, and photoelectrons that are produced. But that's what allows CO2 and water to capture those electrons to make carbohydrates. And then the carbohydrates get oxidized, they lose their electrons, go back to form CO2 and water. And everyone that's listening to this lecture is a battery. You're a battery, you take in food, and you convert your food into various redox active substances. And some of us, or some living organisms, are particularly good batteries. Um, uh, Bill Kem knows about one, that's Torpedo Californicus, the source of the acetylcholine receptors that, uh, that he has studied. But Torpedo has a high electromotive force. It can convert the chemistry of its metabolites into voltages. And I was reading this morning in the BBC, it's funny when you're getting ready to give a lecture, your antenna are out and you see many things. There was an article in the BBC about how electric eels work in little groups so that they collectively zap their, their uh, prey. They don't rely on one eel to, to kill. They actually have, have extra current going into their prey. So with that, I will thank you for your attention. And I hope that, um, that you've learned a little bit about why these three gentlemen got the Nobel Prize in 2019. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Or try to answer any questions. Man. Yes. Excellent lecture as always, even if you try okay. to put me on the spot. So I thought I'd return the favor. You know where Volta taught and was a student? You tell me, Ken. He's at the University of Pavia. See, Ken is, let me tell you why I could have guessed that and then it would have been, uh, it would have been no fun. But Ken has a dear friend at the University of Pavia. And so, so he knows all things Pavia, okay? Um, and I know a lot of things from Bologna because my friends uh, uh, mainly are in Bologna and Anacona. And, um, and, but Ken would say that's all baloney. And so he wouldn't, he wouldn't accept <laughs> that anyhow. And, uh, and, and of course, my, my, friend's, my friend's son is here at the University of Florida. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, so uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to uh, try to answer them. So Dan, I do have one comment. Yeah. And that is, I think you're being a little unfair to Volta. It is true that nature invented the battery as it invented most things. But you know, I simply look at DNA. Watson and Crick got the Nobel Prize for discovering the structure of DNA, but who was responsible for that? Well, but, but nature invented DNA, but they, they did the original work of, of discovering the structure. They didn't invent the DNA. Well, that's the point. And I think Volta's at the same category. Yeah, but Volta, Volta gets a lot of credit. You know how much I have a, a kinship uh, as you do for the Italians. I even have a little property in Italy. So I, I, I'm very happy to give him credit. Um, and he, what he did was he was, it turned out a few people before him had thought about batteries, including, um, including Franklin, but, but what he did was he popularized uh, the cell, the voltaic cell, and that made a big difference. And right. you know, in science, you get a lot of credit for not only the discovery, but doing things where you actually push the science forward. And, um, and we know that, um, and that he was very active in doing that. And of course, Franklin, that crude American from the colonies was an early member, a fellow of the Royal Society. Right. So he was well, well appreciated for his efforts. Yeah, I, I tell students that um, that Franklin was the person who first 
got an accurate idea of how big molecules were because he took oil, olive oil, and spread it over a pond in Versailles. He was busy in Versailles trying to pick the pocket of the, of the king of France. Um, was that the 14th, Louis the 14th or the 16th? Yeah, Louis the 16th, I think it was. And um, he, he figured out how many drops of oil it took to cover a certain area of pond and, and form a thin film. He divided that volume by that area and came up with the thickness of a, of a fat molecule to within 10%. So these people were very, very intuitive and very bright. There's no doubt about it. Um, they, they just didn't have PubMed and big literature. Uh, we, we benefit from having a lot of literature that we can read. So Shirley, you were up early. Well, hold, hold on just one moment. We have a ton of questions that are queuing up. We do have some in the chat, but I was just gonna see if John or other uh, facilitator wanted to make a comment or question or you wanna wait? I'll wait. Okay, Shirley go and then I'll go to the chat. Uh, several years ago, there was a cadmium battery factory here in Gainesville out the road. Yes, was that's just right. Just passing fancy or? Yeah, it was up on 441. Right, uh, right. Uh, I worked there for years, right. Yeah, and, and it's controversial because uh, cadmium, as, as good as it is in the battery, it's highly toxic. It was very dangerous yeah, for the people. Yeah, it, it, it. yeah and so uh, this is a real problem. Um, cadmium and cobalt are, are often used in batteries, but they are a lot more toxic. Lithium is not so bad. Um, and if you have um, some... Um, uh, if you have some bipolar disease, the lithium could even be good for you. Uh, but, uh, but it turns out that uh, cadmium and cobalt are not very good. Uh, they, they, they bind to some of our metabolites so tightly that they interfere with our metabolism. Uh, so ATP, a very important molecule in our bodies, binds to cobalt and cadmium about 10,000 times tighter than magnesium ion. And that messes things up for us. So it's not a good thing. Thank you. You're welcome. Right. One of our chat questions says, what is the cost of making an AC battery? Oh, we don't know. I, I have no idea. But remember, everything when it's prototyped costs a hell of a lot of money. But then people start to figure out all these different things. You notice that, that uh, several of these um, Nobelists were really chemical engineers. They weren't even chemists because uh, engineers have this habit of simplifying things. Keep it simple, stupid is what they do. And so Yoshino uh, really lowered the cost of the battery tremendously by using pet coke. So you, you can anticipate that, that this will happen with the biode as well. Um, it's just I thought we should look into the future a little bit about batteries, and that's why I brought it up. Okay, thank you, Barb. Oh yeah, I'll just have a, I loved your lecture, Daniel. It was really good, um, even, if, even if I am a biologist. But um, I just had one tiny little thing on your diagram. Before you use it again, could you, could you show the voltmeter in parallel with the circuit? Not in, it kind of looks like it's in series. Oh, it's actually uh, in series. The voltmeter? Oh, um, the voltmeter is sitting there. Uh, it, it's yeah, it's just running through. It's in. Yeah, it's a voltmeter. When you use a voltmeter, it's supposed to be parallel and an ammeter in series. But hey. Um, oh, I see. I see what you're getting at. Yeah. Oh, yeah. technically, you could do that. Yeah, you're right. Technically, yeah. yeah it just, and, it just, I, and by the way, um, uh, Barb, I will never use this set of slides again. <laughs> these, these were these. These were made, if no one else was at my seminar than you, Barb, then these would have been made only for you, okay? <laughs> they were only made for this class because I don't teach um, uh, general chemistry anymore. I, I am a specialist in enzyme chemistry. And in fact, as a biologist, the big part of biology is that my laboratory in collaboration with the lab in chemical engineering, we discovered the molecular motor that allows every cell in your body to crawl. And mm. so on some other occasion, if Ken ever arranges to talk about non-Nobel work, 
I'll be happy to come back and tell you how cells crawl, and uh, that'll be more. Maybe we'll have won know. the Nobel by then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, or even one bell. Um, uh, so, <laughs> so, and we'll throw you a party. Yeah. All right. Well, I will be very happy to tell you about how molecular motors work because they're the the intellectual thrill for me. Um, any other questions? Yes. Um, and I do see you, Walter. Hold on there. From chat, we have, um, there's some discussion, what countries are the major sources of lithium and what are the policy issues associated with sourcing lithium? You got me on both. I can't say anything about it. Okay. Yeah. And then, um, let's, so let's go to Walter. Yes. Yeah, I have uh, a comment and a question. Sure. Uh, the question is, do the lithium batteries create hydrogen as do the lead acid batteries. And the comment is related to the fact that I was a submariner and the submarine lithium, uh, submarine lead acid batteries are about the size of a golf cart. Right. And uh, we have lots and lots of them, even on the nukes, because if the nuke goes down, you need to crank it back up again. Right. So question, lithium batteries, hydrogen. Yeah, they do form hydrogen, and um, uh, there's not as much hydrogen form. Um, they're sealed, and so they, they don't tend to, uh, and they're sealed in a way that prevents oxygen from getting in, because that's a real problem if you have oxygen and hydrogen together. Um, but the recharge cycle is done efficiently in a way that you keep the amount of hydrogen relatively low. Um, but um, it's around. It's a, are they subject I, then? Uh, are they subject kind, to bulging? Um, no, I think that they're made in a way that they're so small and they're uh, uh, pretty rigid that there's not a bulge in them. Um, I don't think there's a problem. But but you're right that um, that hydrogen is a is a real problem. I can remember. I'll tell you that I in 1959 long time ago, I bought my first automobile. It was the first automobile for my family. Um, my parents never had an automobile. And so I bought one for $35. It was a 1953 Plymouth uh, Belvedere station wagon. <clears throat> and I um, took it to the, to the repair shop because it wouldn't start. And, the, and this guy was smoking a cigarette and he lifted the hood and he wanted to check my battery. And there was so much hydrogen in the battery, uh, the, the seal was in a certain way that when he touched the battery, his face and his hair seared from all the hydrogen that exploded. Um, and that was, that was, so much on my mind, I said to myself, somebody's got to figure out a way to make a battery that doesn't do that. Now the diehards and all those are sealed so that they, they, don't, they don't have that problem anymore. But, but, um, but frequently the charging instructions say to remove the seals, check the water, and then uh, charge, <clears throat> recharge in an open area. Yeah, recharge in an open area. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and because sulfuric acid is, uh, has such a, you know, it won't evaporate, it stays in, you just need to recharge with, with deionized water, right? But yeah, you've got to watch, um, as you eliminate some of the hydrogen, you're, you're actually, um, eventually you'll have to have new sulfuric acid. Oh, okay, thank Another you. Lynn, Lynn, go ahead. Yeah, my question is just listening to this, and I don't know very much about batteries, that if you can reduce the conversion loss from an uh, DCAC to, uh, from 20% to uh, an AC battery, uh, you're talking about a 17% difference there, if you can get it's it down to that. Yeah. So um, is the U.S. in any way supporting research like through NSF to try to... I, I, I looked for that. I didn't see much, but, I, you know, um, people are always, as things are developing, very close to the vest because um, this, this is a new area that if you 
eventually develop proprietary control over it, you have something that's, that's of, of incredible value. So I think that we're not seeing a lot of literature right now. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Larry Lowenthal, go ahead. For those that don't read um, chat, uh, China is a principal source of lithium, A. Yeah, that's true. And, and B, uh, Amazon is selling, for example, four AC batteries, six volt for $1,250. Oh, an AC battery? Yes. Yeah, but when they sell that AC battery for that amount, if you look closely, it really has an inverter built into yeah. it. It has what? Okay, yeah. It's not a true battery. It's an AC source, but not an AC battery. So what you're paying for is the battery and an inverter. Um, the, there's no true AC battery that's, that's available and that's electrochemical. Okay. You, we're talking about something that's electrochemically generating an AC current. Um, that's different. So that inverter yeah, that's built into that battery uh, is already costing you 20% of the energy. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And you're right, lithium is from China <clears throat> and cerium is from China. Cerium, of course, is so important in the making of, of um, magnets that are used in, in all sorts of devices, including speakers. And so these rare earths are rich in China uh, and Africa, and we don't have as much of the rare earths in the United States. So technologically, uh, it's one thing, but available materials and other. Hey, there are some friends I see. Hello, Carol. Hello, Bill. All right, go can ahead. I ask a, can I make a comment? Sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I'm glad you brought up the electric eel. Oh. Yeah. It, could, it could be an AC uh, battery Yeah, uh, because uh, the resting potential of each of those millions of cells is a tenth of a volt in one direction. And then when acetylcholine activates the acetylcholine receptor channel, the, the membrane flips its potential down to near zero. Right. So in a sense, you could have an alternating current if you could alternately stimulate those nicotinic receptor channels. Yeah. The other comment I would like to make is that because of the electric eel, another Japanese scientist won the Nobel Prize, Dr. Numa, for sequencing some of the ion channels that are so concentrated in the electric eels, electric organ. Yeah. My question now, Dan, is did these three Nobel laureates ever discuss together before the prize? And, and did they, they did, ever one, did one of these laureates help another gain insight other than just <clears throat> reading about the other's work? I don't know that they ever collaborated. They, there's no evidence. I don't think oh, that they okay. collaborated. They weren't. They weren't on the same team. Right. <clears throat> um, if they were, then you would know that pretty quickly because each one of them shared one third of the prize. Usually, if two people collaborate and the other one didn't collaborate, the one that didn't collaborate gets half the prize, and the two that collaborate get the other half, and they share a half. So they each get one fourth. So the, so the fact that if you were to listen to the ceremony, uh, they say specifically they get one third each, okay, which is 10 million um, uh, Swedish, what, kroner? No, kroner. Yeah, and that's equal to about $1.3 million, I think. Yep, uh, 0.2. <clears throat> so it's a good amount of money, but actually, the Nobel Prize was worth a lot more money when, when I first heard about it. Um, when, when I was eight years old, I heard, when I was eight years old, I heard about the Nobel Prize for the first time. It was given to a guy named Fritz Lippmann. Little did I know that later in life I would work for Fritz Lippmann's 
uh, favorite student, Earl Stadman, but, um, but he got something like, uh, like $57,000. Doesn't sound like it's uh, as much as a million dollars, but he didn't have to pay any tax. Now, if you get the Nobel Prize in the United States, you have to pay tax. Uh, the only country in the world. The only country in the world, yeah, yeah. It's pretty miserable that way, um, um, but that's the rule. Yeah, the president doesn't pay, but the Nobel laureates do. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's true. John Axe, did you have any comments? Uh, a, a, a question, actually, uh, having to do with the use of lithium. Uh, lithium and sodium have about the same ionization potentials. Right. Uh, but, but sodium is much more abundant on the Earth than lithium is. Lithium right. was made in the early universe along with the helium rather right. than in the sun. And so it, it has very low abundance and it, hence it is much more expensive, I guess. Yeah. Uh, uh, it, it is the fact that, you, that, that sodium is not used have to do with uh, the, 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 the better transport properties in the, in the electrolyte? I think, it has it, the same kind yeah, of I, think, I, I think you may be right that sodium, well, sodium is, is about as reactive with water yeah. as, as lithium is. So, so that's not a consideration, but sodium, of course, has a atomic mass of 23 right. compared to... Uh, but, but, the amount of, but the amount of lithium in a battery must be, it must be a rather small percentage of the total weight of a battery, isn't right. it? Yeah, you know, there are some things that are different about lithium. It turns out that lithium and potassium take four water molecules around them. They form what amounts to what's called the tetrahedral arrangement. Yeah. Lithium is so small as an ion that you can't get four, uh, four water molecules around it. In fact, this was known for a long time and um, I was famous at the University of California because of this, because somebody mentioned this very small ion size when I was uh, an assistant professor. And they said, you can't get four around. How many do you think you get around? And I jokingly said 3.6. And then within one year, a paper came out in the Journal of American Chemical Society, which determined that the coordination number was 3.6. And so everybody wanted to know why I chose that number. And I said to my students that the trick in life is choose any number. And if it's right, people will remember. If it's not right, <laughs> it doesn't matter, right? <laughs> because they will have forgotten anyhow. So it was a lot of fun. Uh, but that property may be important in the way that it hydrates and the way the kinetics of it coming on. In the way it transports it through the electrolyte. Yeah, so the electrolyte transport may be a, a property there. So it's, it's, um, it's interesting. And, and maybe, it goes, maybe it does not go into the pet coat, as in and out of the pet coat. As, oh, it definitely, it, it definitely wouldn't go into the pet yeah. coat the same way. Yeah. yeah. Lithium is so small that it can intercalate between those layers. Right. Pet coat, by the way, this molecule graphene, people are, you're, you're familiar with graphite because we use it in our pencils. And those layers that we've been talking about are, are so weakly held that as we're writing with the pencil, we're actually sloughing off layers of that molecules onto our paper. Um, if we turn the graphite by 90 degrees, and you tried to do that, you would just tear the paper. So the, uh, the layers that are there are all very, um, they're big. Uh, graphite has very long regions of flat layers, so it's hard to get the lithium in. But graphene is very small, so you have these little islands of, of intercalatable material. So that yeah, makes, in my yeah. physics lifetime, I did some work on intercalated graphite. So I'm ah, not, good, not good, familiar good, with that. Good. I mean, this is what I expect because there, there's a lot of intelligence at, uh, at Oak Hammock. And, and so I'm not surprised that there are people like you that, yeah. So what, did, what were you studying? Uh, we, we were studying using, using neutrons to, to uh, understand where the intercalates go into 
into uh, interpolated graphite. And where were you doing that? Brookhaven National Laboratory. Oh, yeah. When we met, you told me that you were, the last time I gave a seminar, you, you came up to me afterwards and you told me you worked at Brookhaven. Yeah. 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 I went there once to use their, um, um, their Van de Graaff generator and David Silverman in pharmacology, Bill, uh, Bill Kem's uh, longtime colleague, they both came about the same time to UF. Yeah. Uh, David Silverman used it to produce superoxide because if you zap water, or you zap oxygen with, with electrons, then, uh, then he was able to, to generate superoxide very fast to do fast reaction kinetics. So Brookhaven was a, a great place. And in fact, Ken, Ken Burns may remember the name uh, uh, Dan Koshland. Ken, you remember Dan Koshland? <laughs> Dan Koshland was a very famous enzyme chemist. He was the guy who first proposed that proteins change conformation when they bind molecules. And, Ken Kosh and Dan Koshland did most of his early research at Brookhaven National Laboratory. As a, as a young chemist. You, uh, should, you should know that John actually ran the place more or less. Oh, really? <laughs> I, well, I, was, yeah. I was for a short time the uh, yeah. uh, associate director of Brookhaven. Uh, no, that, that, the, but that, the, that uh, the earlier I was not very good at that. Yeah, the earlier <laughs> yeah. directors did not take great advantage because if they had held on to Koshlin, they would have done very well. Koshlin, he, his immediate family owned 70% of Levi Strauss. Uh -huh. Okay, so he could have funded a lot of different things, although you're a national laboratory, so you didn't need money, uh, presumably. But uh, sure. Koshlin, uh, uh, got, he was a professor at UC Berkeley, and the female faculty members got upset that the male faculty had a faculty club. And so Koshlin said, you find a place and I'll build it. And he, he paid for the whole thing. Mm -hmm. uh, this has yeah. been a great discussion. If we'll go to John Reiskin for final comments. Thank yeah. You. yeah, I, first of all, the illustrations were magnificent. Uh, and I, it should be in every freshman textbook. Uh, oh, thank you. Because it, it was so clear and so straightforward. So uh, don't throw them away. <laughs> well, um, and I, I love um, people who know my lectures. I, I always sort of, I, I have, if you look in the dictionary for, uh, for obsessive compulsive disorder, you'll see a photograph of me because <laughs> I'm the person who's always trying to make slides as perfect as possible. Um, uh, you, you, I will you, correct you, that voltmeter. Uh, because I do recall that you're absolutely right. Yeah, uh, Bob will be appreciated. Uh, I, th thank you for participating. It. This is I'm the tenth very delighted. Uh, tenth year. You know, I, I know so many people um, uh, out your way, and I probably will end up being a denizen out there someday. Uh, but yeah, uh, but I have a six-acre property that ha helped to take about half of the weight off that I've lost by working so hard in it, and. I probably would only move to Oak Hammock on the condition I could bring my Kubota tractor with me. Uh, <laughs> well, a, lot, a lot of us don't live there, and um, we appreciate ah. their hosting this course and ah. all the courses. I but see. Thanks you very don't, much. You don't live yeah. there. You live in. Nope. Oh, we, we're a lot of townies here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'd like I see to all of uh, Good. So like so your beard, Dan. Comment yeah. about, uh, about your talk. And that is um, uh, the three prize winners illustrate a very common phenomenon. And that is that a large fraction of the Nobel prizes are won by Americans in science. Uh, but it's noteworthy that as usual, both of the American scientists are immigrants. Right. So for right. those who wonder about immigrants and their value to the US, I think, uh, the Nobel prizes are a very good standard to look including, at. Including the Big Al, right? I mean, we, we had Albert Einstein. Uh, That's right. Uh, Incidentally, just before we leave, 
Albert Einstein was one of, the, I think, the only Nobel laureate who didn't get a penny out of his prize. He gave it to his former wife for divorce settlement. Exactly. <laughs> <A> wonderful. 